that's good. All right. I would like for us, as we start, for each of us to think of someone that you know that has really blown it in their life. I mean, big mistake, tragic, maybe lost their marriage or a job, someone that let anger get the best of them. <laughs> no, you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, sa- I'm saying, think of someone else. Think of someone else for a second. Can you get someone in your mind that, that you know that at some point they got so drunk they couldn't even talk, or maybe they passed out, or maybe they... They got involved in a relationship and it just went south. Or maybe you know of someone that blew it in regards to a, uh, an investment that they thought it was the next best thing and they lost it all, maybe even went bankrupt. Or maybe uh, you can, if you're having trouble, maybe you could think of your, your mom or your dad's worst you know, uh, failure. <laughs> and uh, Dan, I, saw, I see you patting your mom on, <laughs> on, the, on the leg. Yep. And so, well, he got his, all right, he's, he's, he's got his, but uh, maybe you can think of, if you're even struggling, maybe your spouse's biggest mistake, and, uh, or if for those of us that have kids, just think of something that your kids have done that's just stupid, right? And you're thinking, okay, uh, that, that's good. So can you, ha- you have something in your mind, something that you're thinking, okay, so th- this person, they really, really blew it. All right, everybody with me? All right, now, keep that and have that person in your mind. Now I want to ask you, in particular, now you can raise your hand, uh, I want you to think of a time when you really blew it. All right? Which time, right? Where you said something that you regret, right? Or anger got the best of you, or you cheated and got caught, or you lost confidence in yourself, or maybe others lost confidence in you and you ended up losing your license, or ended up in jail, or the time you lied, or the time you stole something. Everybody with me? Can you think of a time you blew it? Like three of you. Gosh, I knew it wasn't going to work, right? (laughs) Seriously, can you think of a time you blew it? All right, yeah, thank you. I'm not the only one. All right. Now, I want you to compare your big mistake with the person that you first thought of, And how do you relate with that? I don't know about you, but for me, I give myself some extra grace. (laughs) How many of you are harder on other people sometimes than you are on yourself? You're like, oh, maybe that wasn't so bad. Or or, maybe it's the flip. Some of you are saying, well, I'm harder on myself. Either way, in many cases, our biggest mistakes are related to our sin nature, aren't they? Oh, so many times. And the bad news is that if we just lived according to the Old Testament perspective, there would be huge consequences for all of us if we lived by the letter of the law of what the Old Testament had. In fact, there were serious consequences in the Old Testament to the point of death. They were killing people for making mistakes. Um, in Leviticus chapter 20, it's one of those chapters that kind of lists a list of behaviors, especially in the sexual realm in that particular chapter, that were punishable by death. When you look at the Old Testament in its entirety, there were three big things, adultery, murder, and idolatry. And if you were caught doing any of those things, they would stone you for those things. Now, in terms of a holy God, right, perfection, we are all guilty for the law, especially if you take Jesus and he reinterpreted the law. And let's just take adultery for a moment. You may not have cheated physically, but if you've even looked at another person with lustful eyes, you've committed adultery in your heart. Or murder, you may not have pulled the trigger and killed somebody, but your angry thoughts would hold you at the same, uh, at, at the same accountability. Or idolatry. This is where it gets all of us, I think, right? If you put anything in front of Jesus being number one, you would be eliminated. We all deserve to be stoned in that regard. And that's my encouraging word for the morning. And so (laughs) let's let's pray and go home, right? Right? Well, listen, with that knowledge, I want us to look at a chapter, in chapter, chapter eight, and I'm sorry, chapter seven, nope, chapter eight um, of John. And we've been studying John, and we've been looking at this, and I've been saying all all along that John 
according to John 20, 31, it was written so that we may believe that who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in the name, we will find life, right? And over the past couple chapters in John, chapter 5, 6, and 7, kind of leading up, we have seen Jesus defending his claims to be God. And it's really been masterful, this great discourse, Jesus giving testimony about himself, right? And then also Jesus calling witnesses. And uh, what's great about that is that as we grow in understanding, as we study the book of John, as we draw close to Jesus, we must become witnesses as well to what Jesus says and who Jesus is. Our words, our actions, the way that we live, uh, they, it should all bear witness to who he is. But in John chapter 8, it kind of continues in the same realm. The big picture of John chapter 8 is, and you look at the big titles there, it's the disputes over Jesus' testimony. We studied that. Disputes over who Jesus is, right? Disputes over Jesus' claims about himself. It's kind of more of the same when you look at it. And again, it's kind of building, and I encourage you to read it, if you haven't, in, uh, in the chapter in its entirety. And really, this question of who Jesus is, it's the big question in the Gospel of John. And if you can answer that question, the rest, any other questions, smaller questions, they'll just fall into place uh, if we get that right answer to that first question. And that's really beautiful, and it's really critical. But tucked in between chapter 7 and chapter 8, there's a story I mentioned that captured my heart over the last couple of weeks. And I think uh, it, it's done that. It's related to our sin nature, to our biggest problems, our biggest mistakes, those I've blown it moments. And we've all had them, and I know we have. And the story ultimately teaches us to bring our tattered mess, our lives, to the Lord. And we're going to learn this morning how to look at ourselves in regards to our sin, our sinful behavior, and then how to look at each other. And, uh, and I hope that it really blesses you. It's blessed me. I do want to warn you that uh, instead of picking up stones and saying, oh, I know how to deal with others with sin, or I know how to deal with myself, right? We need to learn to drop the rocks in our lives, and we're going to explain that what that means. And this passage is full of grace and good news for those that are caught in sin, those that have been caught up, and that would include all of us at some level or another. But before we read these uh, 12 great verses, uh, we, I've got to acknowledge something. When you turn to John chapter 8, uh, just in fact turn there if you're not there already, um, before this section, there's a little side note in my Bible and many of yours that says the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have these 12 verses in their Bible or in, in the original manuscripts. And you say, okay, well, what's about this? And in fact, I mentioned it to Pastor Bobby that I was going to be preaching out of these 12 verses. And he said, oh, he said, that's, that's like a, a preaching faux pas, right? Because <laughs> you don't do that, right? Well, yes, you do. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to kind of explain. When the, the canon or the Bible was put together over a series of hundreds of years, um, the, the legitimate scriptures kind of rose to the top. And uh, it, it is true that most scholars believe that the Apostle John did not write the 12 verses that we're going to study this morning. In fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke most likely did not write these. Uh, it was added later in, in somewhat of a parenthesis, uh, where the scribes later, to help make a point within the scripture, they added this story. And some add it in John 7, 36. Some add it in 7, 44. Some put it at the end of John in John 21, 25. Others put it in Luke's gospel, which is kind of blows your mind. But um, Luke 21, 38 uh, but the important thing for me, and I think for you to note, is there's no reason to doubt its substantial truth. It's in God's Word. It, it has uh, uh, made it through the test of time, and it's historically accurate. It's a true story of Jesus, and it was passed on verbally first and then written 
into Scripture, and we are going to look at it this morning. Now, with passages like this, when you read through Scripture, there are several areas like this in Scripture. There are four quick things that, that I think that we need to acknowledge before we read this. Um, first, is there anything contradicting here? And we would say no uh, in this passage in particular. Are there principles consistent with other Scriptures? The answer would be yes, that it's consistent with other Scriptures. Is there any definitive proof it should be left out? And you'd say no, there's nothing that would say, no, we should leave this out. And then the fourth question, and this is the key, is what we see consistent with what we see of Jesus in his life, in his ministry, in his activity? And the answer is a resounding yes in regards to these verses. And so we're going to study it, and we're going to preach God's word as God's word. It's legitimate. And with that, when we look at these verses... I want you to see, start to see how to handle your own sinful nature and behavior. How do you handle others' sinful behavior? And drop the rocks. Let's see the grace in this. And I'm going to read it in its entirety, and then we'll come back. Let's look at it. In uh, John chapter 7, verse 53 is where we'll start. It says, Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared, uh, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order uh, to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When, he, or when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up again and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Lord, I pray that these, the words here would just ring true this morning as we just take a few moments looking at this. I pray that you would speak loud and clear. Help us, God. Help me, Lord, to be able to communicate your word. Lord, we need more of you, less of us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, when we look at this story, um, how many have heard this story or maybe read this before? It's, it's pretty familiar, although it's the only place in the Gospels that it's seen here. Uh, we, it's at the end of the festival of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, and, uh, and though that's concluding. And then everyone goes home, it says, but Jesus goes up to the Mount of Olives. It's interesting. How did Judas later on know where Jesus was? Because Jesus went there a lot. He would get away, he would pray, he would be on his own. It's interesting, in Matthew 8, 20, it says, the Son of Man has no place to, race it, to lay his head and, uh, and so Jesus didn't have a home necessarily, but he would go to the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane would have been in that region. And, uh, and then he finds himself um, at the temple courts again, kind of in the synagogue. And he's, he's seated at a place called, uh, it says he sat down to teach. And in that day, that would have been the tradition. He would have been se seated in the seat of Moses and it's interesting how he's talking, and then they come in and talk about what Moses said, and uh, that was very interesting. In verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees, who are the legalists, to say the least, they come in, they bust in, and they bring, dragging with them, this woman caught in adultery. And this is where the drama kind of begins. It's intense. It's an intense scene. It says that it was just the way she was caught, kind of caught in the act. So, I mean, if you can imagine, her hair would have been, uh, you know, all undone, maybe half clothed, full of shame, uh, tons, you know, tons of humiliation. She would have been afraid to be brought in front of uh, this, this group within the temple courts. And then they call on the law of Moses. 
going back to the Levitical law, right? And, uh, and there's lots of places that talk about this. And in, by the letter of the law, this woman should have been or could have been stoned to death. I mean, just imagine that. I mean, a, a fist-sized stone being thrown at somebody. I mean, how brutal is that? That's what she was facing because she was caught in adultery. But what's going on here is not so much that the Pharisees and the, the scribes that they wanted to necessarily kill this lady. They were, in, they were trying to trap Jesus. They were trying to create a situation where they could pin him against the Old Testament and, and uh, uh, what he was saying. And you say, well, how do you know it was a trap? Well, for one, they only brought in the woman. Where's the guy, right? Come on, right? It takes two to tango, right? Right? So where's the man? It's, it's interesting. You study this. Some say that the, the man might have been part of the Sanhedrin because it was very common to have adultery with, even within the leaders of the church. Uh, we don't know. But regardless, they drag in this woman. The stage is set. What is Jesus going to do? What is he going to do? And he leans down, and I would if my knee felt better, right? And he leans down, he starts writing in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote. It's speculation. You know, he could have been writing the law of the Old Testament. He could have been listing the sins of the leaders that were there. He may have been writing names in the sand. We don't know. Pastor Pete, when we were talking about it, he said that you had heard somewhere that he may have been like uncovering maybe a monument that was covered up with sand, maybe something related to the Old Testament law. We don't know. He could have been doodling. I don't know. And it really doesn't matter. But they keep on pestering him, keep on badgering him, keep on saying, what are you going to do? What about this? Moses law of this. What do you say, Jesus? Trying to trap him. And they wouldn't let it go. And then in verse 7, Jesus straightens up. And that term there is really a sign that judgment is coming. He sits up, he stands up to deliver a judgment. That was what was to be expected. To throw her under the bus, so to speak. Judgment is coming. But instead, Jesus delivers grace. It's amazing. It's interesting, just a couple of verses uh, or chapters before John 8, in John chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And this is a living example of exactly that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, describes Jesus as humble and gentle. And I, you, know, you look at this story and you, you wonder, did Jesus raise his voice and say it nice and loud? Let anyone who has no sin, or the, to be without sin, be the first to throw. Or did he say it nice and quiet? Because sometimes in the silence, it hurts even more. And I kind of see Jesus just a humble, just saying, man, is there, if, let anyone of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone. At her. I just see a meek, gentle Jesus caring. Anyone without sin. And the reality in that, in that sense, the leaders there, the others around that were listening, they all would have made the connection that they were all guilty. None of them could live according to the law perfectly. They were all guilty. By verse 8, you say, well, what's going on? And verse 8, I love, it, love what it says. Uh, verse 8 says, again, he stooped down, he rode in the ground again. And at this point, you know, this lady half clothed is there. And then it starts in verse 9, one by one, they leave. The older ones first, the older ones first. We'll talk about that in a second. And then it's left, just Jesus and this woman caught in adultery. Two people that couldn't be any more different are there. And let's look at it again. Verse 10, Jesus straightened up again. Again, she thinks judgment is coming. And he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Man, no condemnation. 
and then go and sin no more. It really gets to why Jesus came. In John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world, right, that he came, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but would have eternal life. We know that. Verse 17 continues, says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And we'll look at that at verse in a few minutes. Now let's go back to the beginning when we started thinking about the biggest mistakes in other people, those that are closest to you, maybe your acquaintances, or maybe even looking in within yourself and saying, man, I've blown it. Think about uh, things that would naturally, where people would want to pick up a rock and throw and cast judgment or teach someone a lesson, right? Or things that you would like to hold on to, hold against others. And what's interesting is there are all kinds of these rocks that we pick up as human beings. For example, how about picking up a rock of righteousness? Or maybe self-righteousness would be a better way to say it. Saying, I am good, I am godly, and you are not. How many have ever had that conversation in your head? Or maybe said it out loud. Or you believe that you're better than someone else. Or you measure your sin against someone else's sin, and you think, well, I'm not that bad, right? Am I the only one? <laughs> right? Or you look at your life and you say, man, things are going pretty good. God's grace has been pretty good. But you start to take credit for God's grace and what he's done. How many know that's not right either? It's this righteousness, this rock of righteousness. And what that communicates is that there's a standard and you're measuring someone else against that standard. The second rock that people pick up is a rock of rightness, which is similar but different. Well, the rock of rightness would say, it's not my fault, it's not my issue, I am right, and you are not. And that type of rock, what it does, it communicates, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. And maybe you're ready to throw it. The third rock is a rock of resentment, where you say, well, I deserve better than this. Or I have done a lot for you, right? Or I've given a lot. Or I've sacrificed for you. How could you possibly hurt me? And you hold on to it, and there's resentment there. What you'll notice in all these rocks is that it's I, 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 a whole lot of I. Or me. The fourth rock is a rock of revenge. How many have held these rocks or thrown these rocks, right? I will make you pay. I will make you feel the pain. Or I know things about you and I'm going to share those things. Or I'm not going to let it stand the way it is. I will let everyone know at home or in the office or at school, you are going to pay is what that communicates, right? Rock of resentment says, communicates you hurt me. A rock of revenge says you are going to pay. A rock of rightness says it's not my fault. A rock of rightness kind of communicates a standard. And then the last one is a rock of retreat, which is a little different. You may pick up a rock of retreat and say, I am not going to throw this rock. Instead, I'm going to collect it, <laughs> collect them, collect offenses, collect hurts, and hold those things. Or it's a, I'm going to retreat and hide so, so I don't get hurt. I'm not going to let myself get hurt again. What happens sometimes is that people will serve in the past, they get hurt, and they say, I'm not going to serve ever again. Or they used to lead or used to participate, but now they back away and say, nope, it's not worth the potential pain, Right? Or maybe it's you used to engage with your kids, but there was some brokenness there. And now all of a sudden you're saying, man, I've got hurt before. It's not going to happen again. In all these cases, what we see, it's a judgment call on our part. We are becoming the judge when we pick up those rocks. And what our goal is that we're going to drop these rocks. When we get hurt, when we get rejected, when we get looked over, we feel left out, whatever the case might be, when someone else's sin affects you, or even if it doesn't affect you directly, 
let's remember that we all deserve first and foremost to be stoned. None of us are free from that sort of guilt. So when we look back at the story, what can we learn? The first thing we can learn is that sinners, this is one of the big takeaways, do not condemn when they realize their own sinful nature. Sinners do not condemn when they realize their own sinfulness. Let's look at it, verse 7. Verse 7 says this, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Again, let's listen. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. In verse 9, we see one by one they left, starting with the older. And your thoughts, your actions, your attitudes, your sin puts you in the same category, in that same mentality, saying, I am guilty too, just like she is. And if that's the case, we cannot cast judgment. We should not cast judgment. Now, there's two extremes in, in our Christian walk. I see some Christians that go around like they've got a microscope, microscope looking and assessing and measuring every little thing, picking up every little stone too quickly. And that's not healthy. On the other side, I see some Christians, they kind of have the reverse binocular idea. Have you ever done that? Where instead of bringing something close, they, you turn it around and everything is real distance. And they say, well, it doesn't really affect me. It's kind of out there uh, and that kind of thing. And so it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really uh, affect me too bad. And so they don't care and they don't hold people accountable either. That's not healthy either. But in this story... The sinners there, the people there, they, each of them left, and only two were left. It's interesting that the, the older ones left first. I was kind of reading that and kind of studying that. I hadn't seen that before. We talked about it as a staff. We kind of, kind of described what was that like. Well, maybe it's because the older ones have more life experience and more sin to, to kind of hold them accountable. And, you know, or maybe it's that younger people kind of carry more pride and haven't had uh, the same, same uh, you know, opportunities to be humble uh, or they are quick to justify whatever. But my thoughts when I read that and as I was just praying and interceding over this passage, my thoughts went to my grandma who just recently passed a couple months ago. And I know I've shared a lot about her recently uh, at different times, bits and pieces. But my grandma was one of those folks, uh, one of these ladies, that she was never judgmental, ever. She was always so gracious with me, with my cousins. My cousins, I, I mean, a lot of my cousins were, got really crazy and got caught up in drugs and alcohol. Uh, my, this one, my one cousin got this, had a first-time guy that's learn, just learning how to tattoo, had them tattoo the Detroit landscape on the back of his, on the back of his uh, uh, back. And um, I mean, the whole family's like, what is wrong with you? Like, who would do that? You're right. And my grandma, I mean, just loved him, you know, he just, you know, and um, I had some cousins that were really lazy and just would never work. And, and my grandma was always very gracious never condemning. Even with me, she was, and I mean, not that I was uh, perfect by any uh, stretch of the imagination. There was one time, I remember, we were driving, going out to the lake, and I think I've shared this before, but I was trying to convince my grandma that I needed a testimony, that I needed to drink and to smoke, and, uh, and so that I could have a testimony, and she lovingly, <laughs> graciously shared with me that, hey, you've got the best testimony, but she didn't just throw me under the bus, didn't be like, you're stupid. You know, I, never, <laughs> I never felt that from my grandma. And uh, you know, as I thought about this, my grandma was a seasoned believer, and I think the older she got, the more she was like Jesus. I just, you, know, you, just get, you, you see things different the older you get. You don't condemn you know, I'm sure my grandma had a sin nature. I, I couldn't see it, but uh, others probably did. But sinners do not condemn when they realize their own sinfulness. Just let that sink in. 
Is that true about you? I hope it's true about you, and I hope it's becoming more true about me because the older we get, the more mature we should become in our faith. The other thing I see in this passage is that God himself does not condemn sinners, at least for now, because at one point we do know that there will be a judgment, right? There's a, but we're living right now in a season of grace. When we think about who Jesus is, and that's what John is all about, when we think about who Jesus is, we know that he's the light of the world, John 8, 12, a little later in this chapter, that he sheds light on our sin. He exposes our sin for our good. We know in John 8, 36, that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. He sets us free from our sin, right? And just like in this story, this woman is set free from the sin that she's found in, and he says, go in sin no more. Let's look at it again. Look at it again in verse 10. Jesus straightens up, says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, no, sir. And then he says, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus does not condemn sinners in this season of grace that we are living in. He says, repent and go and sin no more. And that is good news, that we can bring our mess, we can bring our lives to Jesus and leave it at his feet. Aren't you grateful for that? I know I am. But some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Someone has to pay, right? And you're absolutely right. What's interesting, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. I'm sorry, Romans chapter, where, where is it in my notes? Well, yeah, it is Romans 8. Chapter 1 it says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know that. Some of us uh, have memorized that. But we understand also that Jesus, just a few months after this story was told, he would pay for the sins of this woman. And he would have cringed almost, I could imagine, knowing that this is one more sin that he was going to bear on the cross. And what's great is that he does the same thing for you he does for me. He takes our sin. He's taken our sin. He's paid for it already. We just need to confess our sins. You say, well, what's the response here? Um, when you look at this, uh, it says, um, for therefore is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law would condemn that brings death, it exposes our sin, it's forgiven. It's, we're set free from that. For what the law was powerless to do, verse 3, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Jesus met every, fulfill, he fulfilled the law. He took our sin completely on his shoulders who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's what we are called to do. So what is our response? We should be bringing our sin to the Lord. This woman in this story was caught in her sin. And no one here this morning is being exposed publicly, saying, hey, look at Pastor Pete, or you know, whatever, right? But it's quite possible that some of us here are caught in a similar way, trapped in a similar way. But it doesn't have to, in, in this case, it was a sexual sin. She's caught in adultery. But it could be anything where are you caught up? What, where's your sinful nature getting the best of you? Has a hold on you? Are you caught up in sin? In some sort of fantasy? Maybe it's an inappropriate relationship, or maybe it's the internet, or maybe it's an affair. Or maybe it's something else, drugs or alcohol, addiction, I don't know. Or maybe it's just the wrong attitudes, Right? We need to bring those things to the Lord and say, God, I give it to you. I give it to you. 
You know, I was thinking, I wasn't sure how it fit and just kind of put it as a side note. I want to take a, just a side step for a second. We got a minute. There was a time at my last church that the pastor that I uh, served under, um, he was, he dealt with our staff. Um, it was super gracious. There was one time uh, one of the staff members came to him and kind of confessed uh, some sin, and, uh, and he did not throw him under the bus. In fact, he kind of just surrounded him and got him help and, and uh, sent him and his wife for counseling and, uh, and restored, and it was, it was beautiful because that staff person uh, confessed the sin that was kind of gripping him at that point. I also watched another staff person. It actually happened right after we left. Uh, another staff uh, gentleman was caught in his sin. And it was still gracious, still loving, but he lost his job over it because he didn't come forward and confess. It's just interesting how that works on this side of eternity. Now, in, in heaven, we're forgiven, right? But there is a difference. And didn't say this for service, but I just feel like there may be some that are trapped and need to step forward and confess. Confess to a spouse. Confess to someone to kind of clear the air. And I promise you, you will be met with grace and forgiveness. And we're not going to hold things against each other. We are not the judge. Aren't you glad you're not, for real? This morning, if you're here and you've got sin in your life, we want to give you an opportunity to confess that. You may be here this morning and have never confessed your sin, and if that's the case, we would bring you to a place of salvation, saying, hey, you know, you're lost without Jesus, and, uh, and we, we want to do that. But then that other part that we talked about, as Christians, we're good at picking up rocks, aren't we? Man, rocks of self-righteousness, rocks of rightness, rocks of revenge, resentment, or those rocks of retreat where we just kind of hold it all in. That will eat you alive. It's not worth it. We need to let those things go and let God take over. And I think we look more like Christ when we do that. We look more like my grandma, that's for sure. Not judgmental. There's a song that I asked Pastor Bobby to do, and we sang it earlier, and we're going to just kind of set our hearts before him again. The song of I Surrender. And there's the part that really sticks out to me, at least in regards to this, is it says, Lord, have your way in me. And as we just take this message and this word, this story, and we let it just kind of sit on our hearts, let's stand and let's sing this song and set our hearts before the Lord, and then we'll come back for an official response. Great. I want you just to think for a moment in regards to your big mistakes. Some of you have dealt with those and confessed those things and given them to Jesus. There's others of you that are still caught in your sin. And I'm talking to believers here where you just struggle in some way or another. There may be even the sense that nobody knows or Maybe only those closest to you, but you've fooled others. This morning is a call to repentance and a call to clear the air and bring our sin to the Lord, confess our sins. And if you're here this morning and you're ready to do that, just say, man, I need to kind of clear the air. I need to confess my sin. I want you just to raise your hand right where you are. Uh, just to acknowledge that that's kind of in the state that you're in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I can't tell you how many times if I was sitting here in this, this state uh, there, that I've been in messages like this or that I would need to respond. <laughs> I get that. There's no condemnation. We're not throwing stones. Who needs to repent this morning and say, man, I, I want to cleanse my heart. Confess those things to the Lord. Confess it to others. The other part is we pick up rocks so easy. And we almost think that it's our duty at times to do that. Or we hold on to things. And what it is, it's we're casting judgment. And how many here are just saying, I need to drop some rocks this morning and just kind of leave some things at the altar? I need to, God to help me in my mindset. Yeah. To not judge, to not bring condemnation, but instead to bring grace to whatever circumstance we might, might be faced with. Grace in your family, grace in your marriage, grace in raising your kids, grace at the office, grace wherever you go. We bring it to Jesus. We leave those stones at the altar. And we walk and we become more and more like Jesus. God, I just pray that you would help us in this moment. God, to walk in grace and truth in a similar way that you did, Lord. And God, that as the song says, that we would surrender, we would give up in a sense, and we would say, Lord, have your way in me. Have your way. Have your way in me, Lord. Praise your name. I think the last thing I'd like to say I felt this as I was praying, and I, for some reason, I didn't, I didn't bring up the story of the two different people on staff, how my pastor dealt with them in first service. But a follow-up to that is, I, I believe that there may have been some things stirred this morning, and some people that need to confess some things and get some things out. And, uh, and I don't know about you, I've been there where I've been in that situation where I've confessed my sin, and, and it's, it's not easy to do that, that we need courage to do that, right? But also, we need courage on the other side that it's quite possible that we'll walk out of here and someone that's close to you may bring something up that's very painful, very difficult to understand or to hear. And we need grace on the hearing side as well. That's what this story is all about, that we're not going to condemn. And not that it doesn't hurt, not that it, someone doesn't need to pay or that there's consequences, right? But let's just pray as we close that God would help us on either side of the story, that we would be quick to confess and that there would be grace there, but we'd also hear the confession and be gracious and not condemn. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd go before us, behind us, and around us. Help us, Lord, to be more like you, even in difficult circumstances, I pray. And God, bring us back together, the family of God, to worship and to celebrate your goodness and your power and your grace in us. We thank you for this. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We love you. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. If you need someone to talk to, we're available. Otherwise, go in the grace of God this morning.